everyone. You can all take your places. We're going to get started. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming to our beautiful town hall, the gorgeous room. My name is Paige Lyons. Um, I am so excited to be here tonight. Um, I am here as a sandwich member of the League of Women Voters of the Cape Cod area. Um, and we are hoping to form our own unit here in Sandwich so we can continue to have uh, these events here in Sandwich. Um, we will be a unit that will concentrate in the beginning at least on voter service and on citizen education. And just a little bit about the League. Um, the League is a grassroots nonpartisan political organization which encourages informed and active participation in government. It works to increase the understanding of major policy issues, and it influences public policy through education and advocacy. And as I look around, I see a lot of folks who have already been doing that on their own, so I hope that we can all join together and do that together. Um, please consider becoming a member of the League. Men and women are both um, invited to join. Uh, we do have some literature on joining in the back of the room there. Um, if you're interested in that, we, uh, you can also get in touch with the um, the website, and that's www.lwvcapecod.org. We'll have our next sandwich meeting right across the street at the First, First Church on Monday, April 11th, uh, 11 a.m. So they were kind enough to give us a room. It's a lovely room. And now, I guess, it is my pleasure to introduce Judy Thomas. She is the League President, and she will be our moderator for the evening. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I've been hearing about this beautiful town hall, and really, just walking up the stairs, it has this neat smell, like new, fresh, clean, it's really exciting. So thank you for um, being here, giving up um, any, any uh, NB, what was it, NBAA, you know, the basketball game That's tonight. Good. I know some of you would be watching it. <laughs> I would be watching it. Uh, so thank you for giving up that event and being here to learn more about your candidates for office this coming May. Uh, one of the things that the League is very particular about when we do forums is to make sure that the moderator is not from the town in which the, the uh, races are being held. So I am from Chatham. I, uh, I read the newspaper, but other than that, I really am not very knowledgeable about uh, the town of Chatham, or town of... <laughs> Chatham, I hope, sandwich, and uh, so I'm totally impartial to any of the candidates or even probably most of your issues. I'd like to explain, well, first of all, I want to thank the candidates. You know, on the Cape, there are many races that aren't contested, and when you don't have a contested race, you really don't have the opportunity for a good discussion of the issues or a chance to hear how the, the candidates think. So for the school committee and for the selectmen, it's nice that it's contested and that the citizens and voters of Sandwich have an opportunity to really hear the issues. This is how our forum will work tonight. I think all of you have received little three by five cards and pencils near, when you came in. Is that correct? If anybody needs one, if you raise your hand, we'll make sure you get one. These are for you to write your questions on. Um, issue-oriented questions, not personal questions, but related to a particular issue that affects the town or the school, as the case may be. If uh, additional questions after you've filled out one card occur to you, raise your hand again, get another card, and we'll collect them. And then the way we work it is we have um, sorters, question sorters. Um, Renata Sands of Sandwich and Karen Miller will be sorting those. That helps me, rather than get a whole big bunch of cards, they will group the, all the same topic together, and I'll just read one of those questions, uh, and that's how we'll work that part. Um, each candidate will answer each of the questions, and they will have two minutes to do that. Their opening statement will be three minutes. Now, a question always comes up, and I, I know this so well, Somebody will say to me afterwards, you didn't use my question. 
I got to tell you, I've been there. I have felt, they didn't use my question. I worked hard on it. I thought it was a really good question. It just means that there were too many questions. And there might have been three on one subject and only one on your particular subject. And we, we took the more popular, if I can use that term, question. Uh, and, but usually the situation is just too many questions. We probably have time for only five minutes, or five questions um, for that. The other thing I'm going to ask you to do, well, two things. If you have your cell phone, please turn it off or to vibrate um, so we're not disturbed by ringing phones or any other kind of technology. And the second thing is to hold your applause until the end of each section. Our first section will be the selectmen when they are all done and have given their closing statements, then you can give them a good hand. If we do it at when you, they say something you like, that takes time away from our program, which means fewer questions <coughs> to be asked. So we find this is most efficient in terms of allowing the most of your questions to be asked and answered. The candidates have all been informed and agreed to our format. And with that, I think we will begin. And they drew lots or cards. And um, Frank Panorf, and I, will, well, I set it right, per Panorfi. Very Frank Fernorfi right. will be starting. He will introduce himself and then whatever else he chooses to say. Frank. Thank you, Judy. Um, Paige, thank you as well. And thank you to the League for holding this event. Um, for the folks who are here, appreciate your coming out tonight. And for the folks at home, uh, again, uh, we appreciate your listening in. Uh, my name is Frank Fernorfi. I'm a resident of East Sandwich. I started vacationing here uh, back in 1980 with my wife Lorraine and our three children. Uh, we built a, what was at first a summer home with the idea of someday retiring here. Uh, when I retired from work, uh, we lived in Connecticut at the time that we built this home. Uh, we did in fact uh, start um, moving permanently back in 1999 became a full-time resident, registered in the town of Sandwich in 1999. When we were in Connecticut, my wife and I, the last uh, two years in Connecticut, uh, we were quite involved with the Meals on Wheels program. So when we first moved to uh, Sandwich, we wanted to get involved with the Meals on Wheels. Um, I knew I had the time, and I also decided at that point in time to become involved with an area that I felt was very important from having listened to a lot of folks in town that was economic development. Uh, apparently, uh, we uh, have taken quite a big step uh, in that particular area with the formation of the SEIC. Uh, also, uh, I was elected by the Oak Ridge uh, PTO to become the community representative uh, for the Community Advisory Council to the Oak Ridge School. Spent one year doing that. In 2002, I decided to run for selectman. I was successful. Uh, I ran again after a sabbat what I call a sabbatical of one year. Uh, I ran again in 2006, uh, was successful in uh, running and uh, winning. And in 2009, I decided not to run for re-election. However, since 2009, I've still been very active in a variety of things. Um, one of the more important projects for me has been the restoration and preservation of this particular building, the rededication of this da town hall in October, the uh, restoration of the piano that you see uh, to my right at this point. Um, Mr. Kennan, as chairman, asked me, uh, I think it was in January of 2010, if I would work with Paul Tilton on the solid waste advisory team on that particular project, and the Board of Select Selectmen uh, appointed me to the SCIC as a board member in June 2010. I'm very uh, happy in, uh, with the uh, achievements uh, made in my six-year tenure as selectman, and hopefully during this program I'll be able to enumerate and uh, provide more information about that as well. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. My name is John Kennan. I want to thank the League of Women Voters, Paige, and all of you for coming out. This is a wonderful turnout. I'm really pleased to see all of you here. Um, I am a selectman now, I'm your selectman now, and I would love to continue to represent you as your public servant, servant going forward. I believe in our community, I believe in collaboration, 
in a continuum, continuum of leadership, which is very important to me, and want to serve you well and in an open and honest way as I do now. Some of the accomplishments that I'd like to cite and what I'd like to continue working on and encouraging is when I was chair of the Board of, uh, Board of Selectmen, I encouraged open lines of communication between the school district and the municipal government. The long range plan, which is key to sandwich going forward for our future and viability of a town is something that I resurrected last year as chairman of the Board of Selectmen. I'm proud to say that the present board has worked together in a very collaborative way to update the long range plan, which, is, which addresses the following, improved delivery of, of existing services, capital asset, man, a capital asset management plan, economic development, and attention to the protection of our historic character and natural resources. I've been very involved in public safety for the town of Sandwich. I've been a champion of a joint public safety building. I hope to see that someday soon. I was instrumental and I'm um, very proud to say that I was part of the hiring process when we chose um, Chief Peter Wack to represent us in the Sandwich Police Department. I've been involved and I've encouraged a very dear friend of mine, Dr. Jack Richmond, who's a leading expert and authority in this country. He travels nationally on drug awareness and drug prevention and teaches public safety or the police departments in this Commonwealth. And I've invited him down here. He sat at a selectmen's meeting one night when we had a panel of individuals trying to address the drug um, situation that we have here in Sandwich and what he'd like to do for the town going forward. I've been very involved with beach erosion, meeting with local, regional, and political figures, such as Senate President Murray. I've been very involved as an appointee of the Board of Selectmen and Chairman of the SEIC, working to encourage development in the Golden Triangle, Industrial Park, Village, Marina, and Sandwich Hollows Golf Course. I've given testimony at the State House on Morant, the future of Morant. I've given testimony on expanding the uses recreational uses, that is, at Sandwich Hollow's golf course. So it's more than just a golf course. I'm very pleased to say and very proud being a board member of Open Cape. What, I, what I've personally done is I've met on an individual basis with Senator John Kerry to encourage federal funding for Open Cape. And myself and a core group of Open Cape were pleased and proud to secure $32 million in federal funding for enhancement of broadband, which will certainly, <laughs> I guess I'm going, I'm, I'm being given this. <laughs> uh, that's the sign to stop. <laughs> Thank you. And Glenn? Good, good evening, and, and to Paige and the League of, Women Voter, uh, League of Women Voters, I want to say thank you for hosting us as well. And to all of you, thanks for coming out and listening. And for those of you who are watching at home, my name is Glenn Pere, and I'm running for Selectman because Sandwich faces some serious challenges. We have to make difficult choices about the services our town provides, the people we employ, the education we offer our children, and the general quality of life for all of us here in town. If I'm elected, I will bring my leadership and experience to set clear policy and direct town employees, spend our limited funds wisely and fairly, and ensure that all of our citizens, from youngest to oldest, receive the highest quality services possible. I'm committed to strengthening our police and fire departments. We need a new headquarters building, and we need to add more staff positions and resources as soon as we can. I'm committed to our school systems, to assuring that we have the best teachers, staff, and programs in place so each one of our students can achieve his or her greatest potential. And I'm committed to strengthening and renewing our infrastructure, our roadways, our buildings, and our physical resources. There's a long list of needs that we have to prioritize and get moving on. Public safety, schools, public works and infrastructure, these are, are big and costly areas, but I will work to ensure that they're not in competition with each other, constantly fighting for limited funds. It's up to us to figure out how to find the funding and resources so that these areas can all be as strong as possible. And we want to be sure they don't overshadow everything else we need and want to do. If you know me, you know I have a record of successful leadership and decision making balanced with fairness and a willingness to listen and comprehend. I strongly believe in the importance of collaboration in order to achieve the best results. 
In my career, I spent 25 years in nonprofit and museum leadership positions. I've managed budgets and personnel in the many aspects of complex organizations. In 2004, I helped to establish Sandwich's own Chamber of, of Commerce to build and support our business base and bring more visitors to town. And I served on the Chamber's board for the past six years. In 2005, I became a small business owner here in town when I opened and operated my own gallery. I had to deal with town regulations and bylaws and sign codes and permits and all the rest, so I understand the complexities of doing that. For the past five years, I've served on Sandwich's Finance Committee, so I have a real understanding about how our town government works, and I can see the areas that we need to pay attention to. And along with other volunteers, I helped to create Sandwich's 10-year local comprehensive plan, which we approved at town meeting in 2009. We want to grow, we, but grow in a way that Sandwich can remain the Sandwich that we know and love. If you elect me, I promise to be fair-minded and honest, paying attention to the process, building consensus whenever possible, and to do what is best for Sandwich and the burdened taxpayers. I'm asking the voters of Sandwich to give me a chance to serve them as selectmen. I need your support and your vote on May 5th. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. And our next question uh, will we'll be rotating, as I said, and we will actually start with Glenn. And so here is the first question of your questions. Our beaches have reached a critical state. The ocean is now breaking through the dunes on a regular basis. We need a stopgap measure to get sand on the beach while we pursue the Army Corps of Engineers. What are your ideas for these emergency measures? I absolutely agree that it's an emergency situation and, and that we need to do everything to pursue the Army Corps of Engineers. It is, the, it is in essence, the, the uh, problem that they created with the canal and with the continuing creation of groins out in, in Scusset and uh, on the other side of the canal. So we lose sand continuously. There are a couple of things. We have tried uh, desperately to go after the sand that's been dredged out of the canal and, have, and that was sent to Boston. We ought to continue to do that. We got some funding last time around as mitigating fees to be able to do some of the work that we need. But I'm convinced that we need to, on a, on a real heavy basis, chase down the, the, go after federal funding to support this effort. It's, it's a problem that is not ours alone and nor can we afford to fix it by ourselves. It's an ever going problem of the, of the erosion of our beaches. It would be a shame to have the, one of the towns that is on, on, the, on the end of one of the deepest and widest canals in the world be f suddenly flooded. I don't think our federal government wants to see that and so I would do everything in, in my power to help move that ahead. Okay. Um, Frank, would you take that next? Sure. Um, I totally agree that uh, there is a problem. It's a problem that's uh, really occurred over a number of years. Uh, the people that are responsible for this problem are the people who built the Cape, the Army Corps. They've admitted that they, uh, in fact, have created the problem in various reports that they've produced. Uh, the erosion of the beach is not one that can simply be answered uh, through some immediate stopgap procedures. It would be nice that if we had the dredgings from uh, the uh, Army Corps when they do their appropriate maintenance work on the uh, canal itself, uh, they should not have brought that uh, sand or those dredgings to the Boston area. We need it for our own dunes. Our problem is really twofold. We have dunes that are eroding, uh, that uh, the breach that exists uh, to the old harbor area. Uh, it's basically a catastrophe waiting to happen. The reality is uh, we did not create this problem. We should ask and really insist that the Army Corps fix the problem. They can fix it. They have the technology. They can immediately start a project, if they wanted to, quite honestly, to start backfilling the beaches all the way to the eastern end of the, uh, of the jetty that's there. Uh, in addition to backfilling and re-kind of establishing the, uh, the beaches themselves, what they then need to do is to have a maintenance program whatever it is, whatever the frequency is, two, three years, that uh, avoid what has happened over the last 50 years. It's not our problem. We didn't create it. We should insist that the Army Corps fix it. Thank you. And John. I'm pleased to hear that all of the candidates are in agreement that the beach erosion is a significant issue facing the town of Sandwich. As I said, I believe, at our last Board of Selectmen meeting, when the issue of beach erosion came up, I would hate to see uh, public safety buildings uh, down on 6A 
become the first casualty of a 100-year storm, and that's very likely, and that would be a travesty. And I do agree that the federal government is culpable. They are to blame. They've, had, they've admitted in some circles to the um, improper or maybe negligent construction of the breakwater on the, other, on the scusset side of the canal. I've uh, constantly referred to In re Katrina, a seminal, seminal case, federal case, U.S. District Circuit Court case that we can use to promote our argument to seek um, a reme remedial measure from the uh, federal government uh, to assist us in addressing the beach erosion. I believe that wholeheartedly. I've given that case to Senate President Murray. I've asked her to run with the case, to do what she can. I'm on a committee with Selectman Grunman now, uh, Kirk Bosmer from uh, Woods Hole, uh, Paul Schrader from this town of Sandwich, Dave Mason attended the me meeting, and I'm sorry if I forgot anyone else, but we are very, very involved in pursuing this very, very important issue. Um, I would like to personally see if it's within the parameters or jurisdiction of the Community Preservation Act, I'd like to see some funding allocated for the beach erosion issue. Um, I'm not quite sure what, how much we would need up front, perhaps fifty dollars to $100,000 to begin, but I'd like to use some of those funds to at least start. But the corpus or the substantially all of the remedial measures and the funding that it should come from the federal government. Thank you. Okay. And we will start the next question with you, John. If elected, what would be your top two initiatives with respect to economic development in Sandwich? Two minutes. I've been working on issues surrounding economic development for a number of years. When I was chair of the Sandwich Chamber of Commerce, which I was for two years, I, along with two other individuals, three other individuals, including Senate President Murray, worked out a plan to secure $150,000 in Massachusetts Office of Travel and Tourism funding, or MOT funding, to update our local comprehensive plan, which we've done. We, and that served as the catalyst to jumpstart that is uh, smart growth and planning in the town of Sandwich. What I'd like to see is new and or alternative ideas for the use of Sandwich Hollow's golf course, not to abandon golf, but to enhance the use up at the Sandwich Hollow's golf course. That would be a 365 day a year sports or recreational dome. I think that would do us well in this town of Sandwich. I'd like to see development at the industrial park, perhaps some kind of campus style office um, situation there. I'd love to see something down at the marina, but we'd have to begin at a very um, basic stage, and that would be linkage from the marina to the village, Merchant Square, and then ultimately the village. Um, all of those issues will not occur, though, unless we address uh, comprehensive wastewater management on the Cape, specifically for us, partial long-term solutions in the town of Sandwich regarding wastewater and our roadways. Infrastructure is key. And I believe in public-private partnerships. We had a symposium in this very hall about a month or so ago regarding or just touting the value of public-private partnerships. And I believe, I believe there's value in a public-private partnership to help us broaden our tax base and to create jobs in the town of Sandwich. And I saw the sign go up. <laughs> okay. And Glenn, two thank, minutes. Thank you. Um, all three of us here served on the, uh, the committee that put, the, put together our local comprehensive plan. And that plan, that 10-year plan, that, which has been approved by the uh, Cape Cod Commission, we approved it here at town meeting in 2009 really directs us in terms of how we should develop uh, and do economic development here in town. We really are talking about smart growth. There are a number of areas that we really want to focus on that has to do with what used to be called the Golden Triangle, now South Sandwich Village, in the, the name, the Marina District, as well as the Industrial Park and down in the, down in the village in, 
Merchant Square areas. And as John said, the key to all that is our getting, having clear plans for wastewater treatment and having that whole program in place so that developers are able to move forward, it's either in the industrial park or South Sandwich Village, that we're, we're talking about all of us here on a single source aquifer, we know we've got uh, a number of different uh, watersheds that we feed into here from Sandwich, so uh, wastewater is, is a critical component in terms of how we're going to do serious uh, economic development. I think that um, with the SCIC in place, that's a, that's a helpful tool, but I think we also need to look forward to our own way of developing w w with the, the Forestdale Village that's, that has, uh, has plans in place that calls for smart growth, and that is multiple use facilities where you, where you have offices or retail on the first, second floor, and you have some residential areas in the, and the top floor, so there's mixed use, much of the way there were earlier plans for what was the Golden Triangle now South Sandwich Village. And I think that's the key to, to keeping Sandwich, the essence of what we have here in Sandwich as Sandwich, so we're not b developing big box stores the way we've decided not to, but developing in smart, smart ways. So I'm not sure if that was the two, the two of wastewater and, and smart mm -hmm. growth development. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. And Frank. Um, as a member of the uh, local comprehensive uh, planning committee, uh, the wastewater advisory committee, and now the Sandwich Economic Development, uh, or Initiative Corporation, I should say, uh, we've been dealing with these issues for a while. In my mind, uh, there are several projects that uh, we can handle and start simultaneously. And in fact, we have uh, been doing a lot of work already. Uh, the first for me is the South Sandwich uh, Village Center. That's what is, uh, I guess, referred to as the tr Golden Triangle by most people. That uh, is in the process in the sense that uh, the SEIC is working out a memorandum of understanding with the selectmen. Uh, once that's completed, we will be able to issue the uh, request uh, for proposal on that particular piece of property. The second piece for me is the industrial park area behind the existing industrial park. If you recall, a number of years ago, we did a land exchange with PA Landers, a consolidation of acreage. Uh, that area that is owned privately by the PA Landers organization uh, is ripe for development. My third would be the golf course also, in the sense that the golf course as I see it, my vision of it is a year-round recreational uh, building, or facility, excuse me, with a building uh, for hotel purposes, a convention center, or um, whether you want to call it an entertainment center, restaurants, shops, golf course, other recreational kinds of facilities. We need dollars in this town. We're not going to get them by just sitting on our hands and hoping that things will get better. We need to be proactive in terms of finding resources. These are just three examples, for me at least, uh, of way of accomplishing that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Turning from economic initiatives to community services, I'm going to combine two questions. Uh, one question, one questioner is concerned um, about new library grant applications, so it sounds like improvements to the library. And another questioner says we don't have a senior center, and suggests maybe we need that more than the library. So let me get your thoughts on that, and we will start again with Frank. Uh, good question. Something that's been tossed around in this particular town for a number of years. Approximately three years ago, when I was a selectman, uh, I worked with uh, Selectman Grumman and town manager Bud Dunham. Uh, we spent the summer putting together a plan to hold forums to determine from the community what they thought the best or probably the more important capital projects were. Uh, we held two forums on Saturdays. Uh, they were attended as typical forums uh, are attended in this town, maybe 40, 50 people. We received feedback. Uh, my recollection of what the town folk who attended those meetings thought were the top priority items are the beach erosion issue, uh, the need for a combined public safety and security uh, facility, roads, and then the, right after that there were a myriad of little projects like making sure the roofs uh, on the schools were not leaking, those kinds of things. Uh, the Council on Aging new facility and library came out at the bottom of the list. Um, 
my own opinion with respect to uh, the library uh, facility, it's uh, the wrong project, wrong time. Uh, I would have done things differently, but that's me. Council on Aging, I totally agree that uh, the seniors in this town have been neglected for years and years. We need to do something. What I would really like to see uh, is for both the uh, Council on Aging folks and the library folks talk about trying to do something in some sort of comprehensive way. I'm not looking for a Taj Mahal, and I, know, I hope they aren't, but some sort of combined facility. If you remember the census report, we're losing young people, but our age, uh, popula aged population is increasing. There's no reason why you can't go to the uh, senior center and be able to pull a book and do some other kinds of things in some sort of combined facility. Different way of thinking. That's what I really would like to see in this town. Okay. Glenn, would you take that next? Thank you, Shirley. Um, I would uh, love to say that uh, we should build the new library the way the, design, the great designs that we saw, the plans are terrific. And I'd love to say we should have a new senior center. but. And I'd also like to say we need a new police and fire as public safety office. And we have to fix the wing school. And we've got $25 million in other capital uh, projects. And we need uh, a $3 million uh, debt exclusion for, the, for our road bond for our uh, infrastructure. The, the challenge that we have is for decades, we have deferred maintenance on our own buildings and infrastructure in order to balance a budget. And by putting that deferred maintenance off, we've made it more expensive and, and, made, and exacerbated the problem. What, what, what we need to do is we need to put, as I said earlier, we have to prioritize our needs. And we have to figure out how we're going to, how we're going to deal with them all in one kind of lump priority. We can't, we can't be addressing this or that. And so I would say we have to do the serious priority of how do, how do we address the capital needs that we have now. If we, can't, if we can't support the buildings that we have currently, I'm not sure how we're going to support new buildings as much as I'd like to do that. As to the library grant, there's a, there's a separate little discussion I want to have about that, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But if you remember, when the last time the selectmen were trying to sell the Golden Triangle, the plans that, that were developed included a library and a cultural center council on aging building. And I, so I would say this ties back to the last question about economic development. If we were to really to push to move forward on the South Sandwich Village, then we could have the, the developers of that area do the mitigation and, and include in that as part of their development both of those projects. The library project as we currently stand is, a, is a, we can't afford to pay for it now, but the grant that's, that they're seeking asks us to go to town meeting coming up to approve accepting a matching grant so that we're in the pool for, for potential matching grants as we move forward. I know we can't afford it, but I hope that we can at least get on the list for matching grants in the years ahead. Thank you. Okay. And John, you want to finish that one? There's no reason why we can't pursue a senior center, community center, and library complex through a public-private public -private partnership up at the South Sandwich Village Center or Golden Triangle. There's a lot of merit into how effective that could be in terms of building a community spirit for community projects, projects that we need. I also agree, and I'm pleased to hear my fellow candidates saying that it's not the right time to build a 42,000 square foot library. Um, I said that publicly during a selectman's meeting. I know it didn't resonate with some people very well, but it's, it's just the way I feel. It's, it's, it's from the heart. Knowing as a selectman, knowing what I know about the town finances, um, I have access to the information as a selectman. I know operationally going forward what we don't have, what, what we should have, to help our town operationally in terms of um, sources of funding. Uh, capital um, projects going forward, as candidate uh, Perez said, um, are just monumental. We have had a deferred maintenance plan. Um, has it served us well? Yes, it has, till now. But we have a convergence of many things coming together that's causing this town and the residents and this, the taxpayers in this town to make some very, very difficult, very crucial decision, decisions about our welfare as a town, as a community. And I believe, I think it's in our best interest, I don't think, but I know, it is in our best interest as a community to do this together, 
to come up with a plan, to come up with a community partnership that will solve the needs of a library, of public safety, of a senior center, a community center, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, a couple of you have, I think, maybe all three of you, I'm not sure, have mentioned one of Cape Town's most expensive projects, and that is wastewater. Mm -hmm. We know all over that it's, it's a very serious problem, and so one of our questioners wants to know about the cost of wastewater treatment, but maybe expand on that a little bit rather than just dollars, but how, where does Sandwich see itself fitting into the treatment of wastewater? Oh, and let's start with John again. Unfortunately, a Cape-wide comprehensive wastewater management plan would be in the billions. Not millions, it would be in the billions. It's monumental in stature. That's why we as a community need to explore long-term partial solutions now working with, again, private developers to assist the town in the way of a public-private uh, partnership or indoor development model to begin the infrastructure work for our own wastewater system in this town of Sandwich. And we can't do it, or we should not do it, just to favor one part of the town, such as South Sandwich Village. It needs to be a system or a project that's built, planned, built, constructed on, for instance, the industrial park with the right kind of piping, um, engineering that will service not just South Sandwich Village, but the industrial park and hopefully at some point, some of the contiguous property owners, the residential property owners. And I think the latter point is what the Cape Cod Commission and the individuals paying attention to the uh, Cape Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan would like to ultimately see addressed, not just a specific need to the town, because this is modular, not just for the town, but Cape-wide. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that I would be able to have the opportunity to represent this town well in securing any kind of funding, if at all possible, federally, to address the wastewater needs in town. Thank you. And Glenn? Yes, thank you. This is, this is indeed uh, a serious problem. I've been saying for a long time, uh, Cape Cod has a unique and fragile uh, environment. We are so dependent on our, our ponds, our lakes, our estuaries and marshes. Something like two thirds of all life forms uh, take advantage of estuaries. And when we start deteriorating those, we deteriorate all of life on Earth. We're a single source aquifer. I, I have said this again and again, I, I, that I'm amazed by the fact that I have, a, I have a well at home. We have well water, of course, and we have our own little septic system. My neighbors on either side of me have well, well water, but once a week there's a chemical truck that, that pulls up and sprays their lawn, and they get nice, beautiful green lawns, and I don't understand where they think that, that is going other than into my, my well water and their well water. Yes, we have to address wastewater. It's going to, the wastewater system, we begin to do it on a, on a comprehensive uh, basis for the town. We're going to have a, a, a clear plan for our wastewater going forward. It'll be billions of dollars, as John said, to do it. We missed opportunities back in the 80s when, uh, when there was money to do sewerage uh, funding uh, uh, that would have paid for 70 or 75 percent of the sewerage in town, and uh, we opted not to do that at the time. But the answer is going to be modular, indeed, which is going to cause us to, to have to deal with regionalization because water doesn't understand, wastewater doesn't understand that there's a town boundary here or a town boundary there when it's flowing underground. And so it's going to be a whole series of local plants, I think, re reclamation plants. And as we develop South Sandwich Village or develop the industrial park, they're going to need to develop our own plants. And we're going to have to figure out how to do that in our own neighborhoods. So neighborhood by neighborhood, as we develop new areas, we're going to end up having to have a, a wa wastewater treatment plant there because and I would say it is a, it's a federal issue, it's a state issue, it's a regional issue as well as a town issue, and we need to seek as much funding through our, our state reps and our, and our congressional uh, leaders as we possibly can. Thank you. Okay, um, as a member of the senior management board of the MMR, uh, I represented the town of Sandwich when I was a selectman. I was also appointed uh, to the um, uh, upper uh, 15,000 protection of the upper 15,000 acres on the base by the governor. Uh, and I was a member of the wastewater advisory uh, or the water quality advisory uh, committee 
The Water Quality Advisory Committee for this particular town uh, took the initiative when I was a member to start developing the requirements uh, for a proposal. Uh, there was some $400,000 in, um, actually it was a million dollars, we finally got $400,000. We had applied for 600 of the $1 million that was available through a settlement uh, with the Textron Corporation and the government uh, for pollution on the base. Uh, those monies were made available uh, through application of a, a request for a proposal to the four Upper Cape Towns. We were successful, even though we had asked for $600,000 to do a study of our needs, wastewater needs in this particular town, we were able to get $400,000 uh, for that particular project. That work uh, is underway in the form of a consultant having been hired. Uh, the reality is this, uh, there's no one solution to this particular problem. If you remember several years ago when the town contracted with the University of Massachusetts on the estuaries program to measure nitrogen levels in both Old Town, Scorton Creek, um, we were supposed to have had some information. Uh, we've generally been told it's not a bad situation, but there are parts and different watersheds in this particular town that do need work, and there are a lot of different solutions. Some of it's going to be buildings, structures, some of it's going to be vernal pools, quite honestly, maybe just building a, a big pond to help uh, with the surface water issues. No one problem. The bottom line, though, with all of this, it's going to cost billions and billions of dollars. You can count on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, we've been talking about money for lots of things, and one of our questioners wants to know, do you have any plans for doing something to improve the taxes in Sandwich? That probably suggests lower them, or let not them increase too much. So, how are we going to fund all these things? And we'll start with Frank. Um, the answer is yes, uh, and in fact, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, I'm a charter member of the Long Range Planning Group. When I first became a selectman back in 2002, one of the first things that was part of my campaign for running was to create a long range plan. Uh, we did that. Uh, one of the components of that long range plan was a revenue generation section. Uh, I came up with the idea of taking uh, tax taken property, getting them back on the tax rolls, and selling that property. Uh, we did that at an auction in December of 2007 and generated $1.5 million for the town. There's no reason why we can't uh, really restart that program. And the reality is we don't even have to do it through an auction. The state gives us two ways of doing it an auction, and we thought that that was the better method for the 11 uh, properties that we were selling in 2007, or an RFP process. We can set up a request for proposal on a computer, have one sheet that identifies a particular property. Uh, we've already done the maintenance in terms of categorizing all of the available properties, making sure that we've culled out those that we want to give to the Conservation Commission, if in some cases they didn't even want some of this land, but someone did. We were able to sell different size properties, everything from 34 acres down to about a quarter of an acre. So uh, there is a market for this stuff. We have no need for this. We can get these properties back on the tax rolls, generating revenue, we can generate capital. I was disappointed that we didn't use the $1.5 million for some of our capital needs. I fought this my last year and last budgetary uh, cycle. I was defeated. It was brought back for another vote, and I was able to work out a compromise of putting at least 300,000 of that uh, 1.2 million that was left after we paid back our taxes and the water company uh, into the stabilization fund. There are other ideas that I have that I'll talk about if you'd like. Thank you. Okay, John. Frank and I have discussed in the past this issue. We do agree on the issue of the tax taking that was successful taking that land using the funds any tax title land that you can sell and therefore take or secure the funding from that sale to enhance our stabilization fund is certainly beneficial to the town in terms of um, our budget i anybody that knows me knows that i've been a real champion of economic development I know it's no panacea. I know it's, I know it's not everything. But if we plan and develop the right way, 
and partner up with the right people to do the right things, we will broaden our tax base. It has worked in other communities, it will work here. There's no reason why we should be so tentative or reluctant to embrace the future. We're embracing the future, but we're retaining or holding on to the past. Thank heavens for the people that appreciated the historical qualities of our town. That has worked, but this is the 21st century. We have needs. We have services that we have to provide to people in this town. We can't do it in a vacuum anymore. We need to move forward. We need to step over the threshold into the 21st century, balancing the equities of all of our specific needs in this town to live in and enjoy a town that we can afford. Thank you. Okay, and Glenn. Uh, thank you. Uh, it, it would be nice to be able to say that we had uh, unlimited uh, tax title properties that we could sell at will any time we wanted to balance our budget, but eventually we'll run out of that. And there are, so we have to look at other ways of, of dealing with this. And this is where I said before, we need to prioritize what our issues are. I, I would love to say we could cut taxes, but I think the reality is it's not going to happen. And you know, I hate to be as a, a candidate and tell you that, but I think that's reality right now. Um, but there are ways to mitigate that. That is, we have to look at more funding. I, I have long and hard said that we are a net spender to the state. We, we spend an awful, send an awful lot of money to the state house and we receive something like nine cents on the dollar. We're a net federal spender. We send, we get, uh, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts gets something like 42 cents on the dollar that it sends to Washington. We have to change those formulas. We also have to look at how we can do things on a, on a more cost-effective basis regionally. We already, we, already, we already do some regionalization. We rely on Bourne, for instance, as they're the overflow for our 911. If we, if we dealt more considerably with uh, our neighboring towns, we could figure out how to better do effective services that would be cost effective for, for both communities. So there's ways of doing the same kind of, providing the same kind of services, but not costing the town of Sandwich as much as it does right now. But if anybody else has a, a plan for cutting uh, taxes, I'm all for it. The, one way to do that would be, I think, to declare bankruptcy as a town and have the state take us over, but I don't think that's the answer. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try and squeeze in one more question, and maybe this one won't require too many words. Uh, will you support the increase in the meals tax? Uh, that I don't know if that's going to be coming up on your warrant, but uh, that I think is the gist of the question. And oh, excuse me, and we're yeah. going to start with Glenn. Oh. Um. That's a tough question to, to ask. We, uh, the Chamber of Commerce has taken on the issue and, and of course all of the restauranteurs, the tourists in town have uh, said absolutely not that it would be detrimental to their business uh, as it is. Uh, but now we've been to the point where several of the other towns on the Cape have made that decision to move forward. And as long as Sandwich wasn't first in that issue, then I think that it's probably a reasonable thing to look at again. I think a number of other state, uh, in other areas of the country, it's actually, they have a higher uh, state uh, sales tax, meals tax, and so forth, that higher than we're paying now here in Massachusetts. So I would say the time is to look at that. We could, we could add another one, one and a half percent on top of the, the taxes that we, of meal taxes now, and, and see that back. Okay, and then we'll go to Frank. Uh, I just came back from North Conway, I took a couple of days vacation, and obviously we had to eat in restaurants, and every time I got the bill, I looked at the bottom line, it was some, close to 10%. I said, oh my goodness. The answer to the question is no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and finally, John. You beat me. I, if you chose me first, I was going to say no. <laughs> oh, well, that, we did that quickly. Well, you implied that we were talking too yeah, much. Yes, and, yes, and actually, we ended up right where we're supposed to be at, at 7.50 to go to the closing statements. <laughs> and for that, um, since Frank started and Glenn finished, we will start with Glenn, one minute closing statement. Oh, great. Again, I want to thank the League of Women Voters and for hosting us and all of you for attending tonight and for uh, asking such great questions. And for those watching at home, thanks for being with us. My goal in running for selectmen is to move forward and get things done. We face difficult choices ahead. We must set important priorities. What we do now and in the next few years will have a significant impact on our town for the next generation and probably longer. 
If I'm elected, I'll do my best to make the right choices for all the people of Sandwich, set clear policy, direct our town employees strategically, and ensure that the town provides the highest quality services possible. I will bring a thorough understanding of how town government works, a strong background in good decision making and leadership, and a commitment to collaboration and open discussion. We need to put ideology aside to work together to do what is best for Sandwich and the burdened taxpayers. My name is Glenn Pere. Please feel free to contact me anytime with your concerns and your opinions. I need and want your vote on May 5th. Thank you. All right, and then John? Thank you. Thank you again to the League of Women Voters. Thank you, Paige. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I believe in our community and that with proper planning, support, and a commitment by the community, we will enjoy the benefits of access to the arts and culture public space, recreation, social interaction, authenticity and a distinctiveness that will be the envy of our neighboring communities. We are living in an economic era which can certainly be identified as being extraordinary. And as such, it is critical to have someone serving as your selectman that is dedicated, experienced, and committed to making difficult decisions when meeting the needs of our community in these challenging times. And if anything that you'll remember me for is your selectman now and going forward, and that is I am firmly committed to honesty, integrity, and a commitment to you as your public servant. Thank you. Okay. Judy, thank you. Paige, thank you. Uh, audience, thank you for attending. Um, for me, having this session in this building tonight uh, is a dream come true. This is the vision that I had some five to seven years ago when I first started uh, with the Town Hall Preservation Restoration Committee and having achieved what we have here now. Um, as a selectman, I have a proven record, track record of accomplishment, of achievements. I have the background. I've run operations of 50 to 900 people, multi-million dollar budget operations. I promise you that I will deliver uh, the tenacity that I've become known for in getting things done uh, with honor and integrity. I also promise you that uh, I will make myself available if you have any questions. Uh, please call me. I am available. I'm in the phone book. Uh, if you want my email, send me an email. I'd be happy to do that. I would love to, in fact, uh, work uh, with various groups uh, to be able to answer questions. I'm asking for your vote on May 5th. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all three, and would the audience show their appreciation. And if our school candidates would come up, we'll get ready for the next portion. theater all my life too. Amateur theater. You're always nervous before you go on the stage. Did you ever do the Scottish play? What? Did you ever do the Scottish play? I preview you those, Judy. No, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Oh, Macbeth. Oh, yes, all right. Preview Macbeth. Those. No, no. no. Yes. No. No, I've never done Shakespeare. It's not like school. Not like when I was in school. Once in a while, I get a test. Oh. 
I like musicals. I see. I've appeared in a number of musicals. Are these on? I'm too old to do that now because I, I look you? silly dancing. Let's begin the second portion. My water. <laughs> we'll begin the second portion featuring our school candidates. And they also will do their opening three minute statements in order that they selected by lots. And so we will begin with Bob Catalini. Thank you, Judy. Many thanks to Paige and the League of Women Voters for this opportunity tonight. I think this is a great, great event. My name is Bob Catalini. I live in East Sandwich with my wife and my daughter, who's a student at the Wing School. I've been a property owner in Sandwich for over 30 years. I've been a full-time resident here for nine years. My background is in public education. <clears throat> I have over 30 years of service. I'm now a retired educator, but I have over 30 years of service in public education. A classroom teacher for 20 years, high school administrator for 13 years. I've taught elementary school, I've taught middle school, been a high school athletic director, as well as an assistant to the principal. So I've been one who has had to follow policy and I've also been one who's been involved in setting policy with superintendents and principals and so forth. I have experience in two outstanding school, school districts, Groton Dunstable, which is in Central Mass, in Old Rochester, which is nearby the Mattapoisett, Marion, and Rochester School District. I have experience with budgets having had to maintain my own budget of an athletic department of nearly a half a million dollars. And that budget would shrink from year to year. So I know the challenges dealing with, that we have dealing with budgets. I've been involved in building committees. And I know building, going forward here, we're going to have some challenges with our school buildings, uh, namely the wing school. I've been involved in a project at the Groton Dunstable High School where we built a brand new school and also a $52 million renovation at Old Rochester. I've, been, I've served on NEASC accreditation teams. I've been chairman of subcommittees in both of those school districts. I feel that uh, I'm a reasonable, objective person. I have no special interest groups that I'm involved with. I'm really kind of an unknown, and um, I think that's in a way that might be a, might be a strength. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I used to be known as, I'm actually more well known as Chloe's dad rather than Bob Catalini, to be honest with you. Uh, so this is a breakout for me. A couple of goals I have. One is I believe we have to be involved, the school committee needs to be involved with the Board of Selectmen with long-term planning. Uh, that's, there are certain facets in the long-term plan, if you read it, where the school committee needs to have some input. Secondly, I think that we have to do some work in terms of marketing. I think the brand of the sandwich schools has taken a little bit of a hit with some negative publicity, and I believe we have to build that brand and, and make it, we can with good leadership and good work. And finally, I want to be involved in setting policies and making decisions that benefit 3,400 children and young adults in this community. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Sherry? Okay, thank you. I'd like to thank Paige and also the League of Women Voters for providing us the opportunity to present our views this evening. For the past 21 years, I've been an active member of the school committee, having served in various capacities, such as chairman, vice chairman, and on most subcommittees and ad hoc committees. Oh, oh okay. <clears throat> Currently, I am on the policy committee working to update our policy manual, which is close to completion and soon will be out on CD. The superintendent search committee, which led to the appointment of Dr. Canfield and chairman of the school committee. Right after the election, we have a restructuring of the school committee where we elect our officers. And I feel that at that time this year, 
that we need to reinforce the understanding of the roles of the school committee and the superintendent and create a strong working relationship. This is needed in order to move the district forward. For this to occur, the school committee will have to work closely with the superintendent to rebuild trust, provide transparency, and to improve communications within the schools, with parents, and with the community at large. The school committee also needs to expand on the work that was started with the meetings with the Board of Selectmen and the school committee, chairman and vice chairmen. Possibly having regular monthly meetings with the Board of Selectmen, Finance, and School Committee, either Tri Board or any other arrangements that's agreed upon. We are facing important issues that involve all of us the Wing School Facility Assessment Report, the Green Repair Program for the roofs and windows of the Oak Ridge and Forestdale schools, and the funding for the 2013 budget, to name a few. If we work together, hopefully we can find town-wide solutions that do not pit the town and schools against each other. Another issue that needs to be addressed sooner rather than later is the Cape-wide and actually statewide problem of the increased loss of students to our schools. This is becoming much worse. I not only do not want to lose our students, but I do not want the town to incur the extra expense of students who attend charter and choice schools. In order to identify ways to improve our system, we should start by devising a mechanism to understand why they are leaving, an exit interview survey of the students' parents. If consistent themes are identified, they could be addressed by the administration. In conclusion, I bring extensive experience and a strong commitment to support all our students and to continue to work on the issues faced in our school district. Okay. It's uh, great to be here at the first seminar of, of the League of Women's Voters. It's great to be in this glorious, wonderful, beautiful town hall that we in San Joe love. And my name is Mike Marola, and I've been in training to be on the school committee for uh, some 13 years. I served in other towns on school committees, a couple of terms as uh, chairman. And uh, twice a month, for many hours, for 13 years, I went to school. And I went to school to learn how to be a school committee person, so I think I could be a good school committee person here for Sandwich. I moved to Sandwich about, I bought my house here in Sandwich about seven years ago. <coughs> After my last daughter went off to the University of Miami, I had four, four children I put through college. And I downsized by coming here. And I live on the corner of uh, 6A and Liberty Street. And a lot of people come by and wave at me while I'm working in my garden. Uh, they love what I've done to my house and my garden. But I want to tell you what I think that you what you have to be if you're a school committee person. You have to be people-centered. That's very important. You have to listen. You have to understand. You have to respect everyone's opinion. And then you end up by making the best decision you can make for the children. Not for the teachers union, not for the administrators, not for anyone else, but the children. A school committee member should not have any personal agenda. Our life here in Sandwich is about our children. And no one knows better what to do for their children than the child's parents. So it's important for a school committee member to understand what a child's parent is thinking and what a child's parent feels about the child's education. And children's parents should feel engaged. They should be empowered and they should be appreciative of the work of the school committee. So with this in mind, the school committee members should identify with parents, with the parents' educational fears, and see to it that the administration and the school committee identifies those fears and explains the system's solutions. A school committee member must be a good explainer a school committee member should be a cheerleader for the system. 
And with every vote that a school committee person takes, the question should be, how does this affect the children? Thank you. Thank you. And Susan? Thank you. My name is Susan Sundermeyer. I'm running for a seat on the Sandwich School Committee because public, public education is important to me. I believe it is the hallmark of a free society. Our children's education shapes the future of society. This school committee shapes it for Sandwich. I'd like to be part of that. I've lived in town for 12 years. My husband and I have two children at the Oak Ridge School. As such, we have a vested interest in the continued success of our schools and, like all property owners in town, in their continued excellent reputation. With a new superintendent coming on board, many voters are also eager for a change in school committee membership. Why choose me? I'm a thoughtful, fair, objective person. I have experience in both business and government. I worked as a project manager in environmental consulting firms. That meant devising and staying within budgets, navigating state regulations and reimbursement programs, and maintaining successful relationships with clients and communities. Later in public service at the Massachusetts DEP, I was an auditor and analyst reviewing consultants' work from a regulatory standpoint. These skills will all serve the school committee well. I have four primary goals, should I be elected. First, to help repair and rebuild trust in our school committee. Trust is built by being trustworthy. My supporters may have opposing views on any given topic, and they do, but they all know they can trust me to evaluate issues thoughtfully, thoroughly, and well. Second, to build stronger working relationships between the school committee and the board of selectmen and finance committee. The school committee has autonomous authority over education, but must work and plan as one of the gears of town government. Schools represent a large portion of our town budget. I think we need to show up to some of the other board's meetings, not just when we're on the agenda, but to listen, learn, and develop an understanding of what they're facing as well. Third, to enable better communication between the school committee and the public. As a school committee member, I'll be available to hear public concerns in person at designated times outside meetings, and I'll investigate ways to improve the school committee presence online as well. Fourth, to be a vigorous advocate for our schools. Each committee member should represent the schools in a way that promotes interest and support, but stronger advocacy is critical as budgets remain painfully tight. A credible school committee will be able to pull for every dollar needed. I'll make sure more of our good news, and there is much of it, gets out. Thank you for listening. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Susan. And we will begin the questions. Uh, there were two that came in dealing with, um, I guess, the situation that's been in the papers most recently uh, regarding the superintendency and lack of harmony uh, with the boards. And the questioners both are concerned with the need to bring harmony uh, back to the school committee, to continue the harmony that existed in the appointment of Dr. Canfield and uh, to restore harmony. So how would each of you work to uh, promote harmony within the school board, school committee? And we will start with Susan. I've been a familiar face at a lot of recent school committee meetings, and I've, I've seen a lot of disharmony, and it's a shame. Disagreement isn't a shame. Disharmony is. And at the, the meeting where Dr. Canfield was selected, that unanimous vote was really something. And I think everybody in the room felt, felt it more deeply than just you know, any other 7-0 vote. I think, it was, I think it was a substantial change in climate, and it does need to be perpetuated. I, uh, I have that as one of my stated goals, to rebuild public trust in our school committee. And it won't mean agreeing with everybody else on the committee all the time. And it won't mean agreeing with everybody in the public all the time. I think harmonious disagreement is, is an important skill. It's an important aspect of board work. And I think increasing the level of professionalism on the school committee will lead us to that. 
I'd like to be part of that effort. Okay, thank you. And uh, Bob, will you take that question next? Yes, thank you. Um, March 24th was an extremely important date with the school committee 7-0 vote to go forward with Dr. Canfield. Um, I think there was a huge sense of relief amongst all of us. Um, regardless, we all know that the recent history in the schools, and we all have our opinion, but I think starting with that 7-0 vote on March 24th, it was time for us to go forward. Um, and I think Dr. Johnson was extremely gracious uh, in her comments the following day to the staff. I think the transition will be a good one going forward, and I think the harmony comes from leadership. I think everybody, all seven members of the school committee need to be leaders, need to be respectful, and I think that leadership needs to permeate throughout the schools, principals, teachers, all the people that we employ. If each of us in our own way is a leader, we can be extremely harmonious. We may disagree and disagree respectfully, but that's fine. I think the end result has to be in the best interest of the, student, the students that we serve. Okay. And Sherry? Okay, thank you. Uh, I agree that that vote was a wonderful vote and really uh, could definitely be a start of a harmonious uh, school committee. But I think that the school committee members have to treat each other with respect. Um, we, we may disagree, we're not all going to agree, we're not even agreeing here at the table, but I think it has to be done in a way that respects each other's opinions. You don't agree, but you can, you can respect them. And I think to go forward, we also have to, as I said, work closely with the superintendent to really to rebuild the trust that this uh, system needs and also to improve our communication. I think we really have to reach out to, the, to people, to uh, the parents, to the community at large, and to let them know what we are doing with the discussions at the table, being extremely open and bringing forth, and bringing forth these issues. <clears throat> there, there are many issues that are gonna be discussed, obviously, as there always is, but I think that there has to be more information, more, um, um, trying to say, it's, it's got to, you've got to be more forthcoming with what is, uh, what the issues are about at the school committee table in a respectful manner. Thank you, Susan. Mike. Well, I really can't understand why uh, superintendent contracts have to be dated just around elections. We had an election uh, a year ago that was emotional and carried on into the school committee meetings. And you know that wouldn't have happened if um, the date of the contract had been different. So perhaps with this new superintendent, uh, we should um, either make a 12 or 13 month contract or uh, zig when everyone else is zagging. We should probably change the date of that so that we can't get into that kind of uh, issue again. But disagreement is good and I hope we see a lot of disagreement on the school committee, but a school committee member should, all of them should respect each other and they should work again for the good of the children and remember every vote that they take is for the children. I think what happened in the past year hurt the children. There's no doubt it hurt the children. It hurt the system. It hurt the town. We need to put that behind us and move forward. Okay, thank you. Our next question will deal with school finances, uh, indirectly I think, or declining enrollment perhaps. Um, if the data supported closing one of our schools, would you be in favor of using this building for some of our municipal needs rather than building, I, I would assume then the town building, new buildings? And we will start with Mike. With me? Yes. 
Well, I haven't seen the figures of enrollment. I have just read the pieces in the paper. Um, Cape wide, we have less and less students in our schools. Will that hold? Will that continue to be? You know, I don't think that's going to be the case. I do think we're going to have increased enrollment. We had the selectmen uh, here talking about expansion uh, a little while ago here at the podium. So to hastily close a school may not be a good idea. Unfortunately, the school committee does not have a good record of taking care of the buildings. I have mentioned that before, and I've run before for the school committee, and I've mentioned that before. I actually think it's a good idea if the school committee buildings were given to the selectmen to take care of. And the school committee could just concentrate on what is good for the children and not worry about roofs and not worry about sidewalks and not worry about heating systems, but worry about the children's education. And that problem of taking care of the buildings would not be the responsibility of the school committee, nor the responsibility of a superintendent. Because so often superintendent's uh, uh, expertise uh, is not an expertise in managing real estate or in business. The superintendent's expertise is in educating children and doing what's best for the children. So I think a long-term solution for the school building problem is to, for the school committee to turn the school, school buildings over, back over to the town just to take care of them. You need a new roof, and the school committee members will say to the selectmen, hey, we need a new roof, take care of it, please. And I think that would, uh, and that would give the school committee more time to uh, work on school committee problems. Okay. And Susan, would you follow up? Sure, because selectmen don't defer maintenance either. That's <laughs> the, um, I do. I, I assume we'd be talking about the, the wing school here. The, um, it, it's a tough question, and it has a lot of components. And the wing has a lot of repairs and a lot of expensive things that need to be done to it. And uh, there have been some credible projections of decreased enrollment in schools. I haven't studied them myself yet firsthand. I don't know how far out those projections credibly go. I don't know where the declines, if there are bubbles in declines of enrollment or if it's tailing off evenly. All these trends have to be looked at pretty seriously before you decide to close a school building and use it for something else. <clears throat> there are attractive things about using a school building for um, other community needs. Certainly, you know, they're great spaces, but they're great spaces for for schools. Um, the Oak Ridge and Forestdale schools were both built to hold about 760 students and both of them have held close to 900. So declining enrollment might bring those better in line with what they were supposed to be holding in the first place. Um, that wouldn't argue in favor of closing a school. That argues that maybe we'd be back on track with what we intended to have those buildings hold in the first place. Um, there are a lot of factors and a lot to consider. I think the, the important thing is that it be a collaborative decision. No one person is going to come up to the plate with all the answers to questions of this magnitude, and it's a town-wide decision. Um, a lot of input needs to be heard. Okay, thank you, Susan, and Bob. Yes, um, I will assume that this question has to do with the wing school as well in the recent report from the consultant. Um, I think this is going to be a big issue going forward, and I think it will be one in which the school committee and the Board of Selectmen will have to collaborate on. I think we will have to look at the data. You're going to have to look at the amount of <clears throat> children that are in really kindergarten, one, grade two right now, and project out what the enrollment might be down the road. Um, in terms of declining enrollment, I will tell you this, I am definitely, I know we have school choice here in Sandwich, and I'm a big proponent of school choice. I think we have to market our schools, we have to try to attract students from other towns to come to Sandwich. There's tremendous competition out there. There's a new parochial school on the Cape, there's a charter school on the Cape that's going to double in size, and they see Sandwich as a fertile ground to recruit students. So we have to make the sandwich schools the best that we can make them. 
if you're a parent of a seventh or eighth grader, you have to be able to, we have to be able to say that Sandwich High School is an extremely viable alternative. Sandwich High School is almost a slam dunk. Um, so I really believe in marketing the good things that we do and in, in upgrading some of the challenging situations that we have. And, and that's, I, th I think that's one way to combat the declining enrollment uh, uh, in this competition and I think competition is good and we need to meet the competition. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sherry. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I would prefer to uh, receive the final wing school facility assessment report. When they came to school committee to uh, talk about their report, we had asked them to expand it, including um, the high school. I think that it is premature to say that we would close the school. I know we have right now over 500 students out of district, but like I had said earlier in my introduction, I think if we can find out what the school system is lacking or what these parents would like to see, that the administrators could work on this. And I would rather see us do that than to just throw our hands up and say, close the school. If for any reason a building was closed, I know the other part of the question was, would we be willing to um, have it be a town facility? Absolutely. I mean, it would be wonderful if the town had use of a school building that was not needed. But I do not feel that we have enough information at this time to make a decision as to closing um, one of our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question deals with uh, things coming forward. When Dr. Canfield arrives and you will be meeting with him, what will you consider telling him as the most pressing challenges facing the Sandwich District? And Sherry, we will begin with you. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to tell him um, that we need to develop a better relationship with the town, with the town's people, within the school system itself. I think that he understands that there is a lot to be done within the system and with the town. He also understands, I believe, um, the need for improved communication. We really do need to get our message out uh, to the town as to what really is going on in the system. The, the wonderful um, MCAS scores at the high school, the production that the um, high school just put on. There's so many things in this school system from the arts, music, uh, sports. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. And these are the things we have to, we have to um, get out. And I just see um, Dr. Canfield as a unifying force to unify the school system itself and then also the schools with the town. And, and that's what I see as his main uh, goal when he comes, and that's what I would like to tell him. Okay. Thank you. Mike, would you take that? When I made my opening statement, I said that I felt that parents didn't feel engaged by the system, that there wasn't enough communication. Um, I think the fact that, uh, as Sherry has mentioned, that we have lost 500 students to other systems is a report card. S something's wrong. Um, I started my statement by saying that what I thought was wrong was this lack of engagement. And, and the school committee plays a very important part in this because the school committee is out there amongst the families, amongst the voters, and takes the phone calls at night and debates publicly things. So I think if uh, we engage the parents a little bit more, we find out what it is that they want, not what the warring school committee wants, that perhaps we'll make progress. And uh, our new superintendent, uh, we look forward to the new superintendent making, new, new superintendent making, better, making better choices. Thank you. Thank you. Susan? I think Dr. Canfield's um, <clears throat> first challenges are going to be to figure out how to do all the work he has to do with no curriculum director and no assistant superintendent. And I think that 
addresses that goes to uh, budget, budget, and budget as his three primary challenges. Um, we're strapped, and he's got his work cut out for him. I would also like to see the um, momentum of curriculum initiatives that have been established continue. Um, and echo also what Sherry and Mike said about engaging in dialogue with parents who've become disengaged or feel like their opinions aren't heard or that their words don't matter. Okay, thank you, Susan. And Bob. Yes, thanks. Um, I thought Dr. Canfield did a great job in his interview. He's a very, very keen observer, and he noticed many wonderful things when he toured the schools here in town. Um, I think that it'll, it'll have to be a collaboration between Dr. Canfield, the school committee, administrators, and people maybe through a public forum to do an assessment. And as the selectmen spoke regarding some of their issues, to really prioritize what the most important things will be to attack first, whether it be budget, uh, declining enrollment, and so on, curriculum. Um, I think there'll have to be an assessment will have to be taken, and I'm sure Dr. Johnson would be happy to be part of that during the um, the transition in June. Um, thank you. Okay. You guys are brief. Yep. <laughs> okay, moving on. Then there is a question. Something I'm not familiar with, but hopefully you are. The questioner writes, as Massachusetts moves to adoption of the National Common Core Standards, what do you feel is the school committee's role in district-wide planning? Hmm. Oh, and who is going to start? No wonder you're looking at me. Uh, let's start with Bob. I'm not, I have no idea what they're talking about, to be honest with you. Common okay. Core Standards? Yep, Ma yeah. Is that person National here? Maybe Common we could get further standards. elaboration. Do any of you understand the question here? Do you, do you know something about it? Did, I'll have, I'll have my, what? Oh, this is my, my husband, and he tutors okay. in Chatham, and he's heard of it. And not sure. told me about it at dinner time. As part of the race to the top, uh, Massachusetts, adopted this national core curriculum standard. Uh, it is that, it's a national standard, and um, they did it, and now I guess we're at the point of uh, trying to implement that. So there is a role for the school committee and the superintendent and all the curriculum people in, in doing so. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, that would be a federal program, and that, I believe that's under the direction of President Obama. Race to the top. Prior to that, it was no child left behind. It's, unfortunately, I think these programs are very, very well intentioned, but unfortunately, they're sort of put on us and the funding isn't there to support it, just like some of the state programs that are sort of put on local school systems and there's no funding to support it. I don't know exactly what all the core curriculum pieces are that you're talking about, but um, I'd like to know more about it, but it's, to me it seems to be more of a political ploy than anything else. That's, that's my impression, having been in this business for a long time. Thank you. Okay, Mike, you mind? I was first elected to a school committee in the 1970s, and I think those were almost glorious years because teachers could do what they want in the classroom. I think one of the greatest spoilers of our educational system has been all of these federal and state programs, uh, teaching to the test, and all this other stuff you hear about. I have seen over the years, and two of my children are teachers, I've seen over the years teachers' hands tied, uh, not the ability to teach the way they want to teach in the classroom, not to using their own creative methods of getting things across. Uh, they, uh, they had to teach in a cookie-cutter manner because of these programs. And then again, these programs, as Bob was saying, are underfunded. So I think these programs have done a lot more harm than good. I would like to see, I would like to see more power return to local school committees to decide what a local town needs rather than some bureaucrat in Washington deciding what we in Sandwich need and what the children in Sandwich need 
or why we're losing some children. Uh, I think the school committee and the parents and uh, selectmen in this town can, can better judge that. And I think we need to free the, the minds and the hands of teachers. Uh, uh, although it doesn't appear that's going to happen, but the point of the matter is I don't, I don't think any of these programs are, are beneficial at all. Okay. Sherry? Okay, thank you. Um, actually, the school committee itself doesn't really implement curriculum or anything like that. But um, what the um, role of the school committee would be to support the superintendent and administrators in uh, doing what they have to with, this, with the curriculum. Um, we work on the recommendation of the superintendent. That's how the school committee functions. So I would say that we would support any effort recommended to us um, from the superintendent. Okay, and Susan? The National Common Core Standards were adopted by Massachusetts in July 2010. We were the 27th state to do so. I make no bones about the fact that my background is not in education. I'm a geologist by education, and I have a lot to learn, and I won't try and finesse you, but that much I did learn. The school committee's role is to make policy to guide the school system, and the superintendent's job is to administer schools and implement curriculum. It's a mutually supportive relationship. So in district-wide planning, I would see the role of the school committee as to support the superintendent's implementation of curriculum. Okay, thank you. Uh, this time we will start with Mike, and the question is, one again that's been in the papers, what is your position on the adult swimming program during school hours? Well, when the town built the high school, it was supposed to be a community resource for everyone, not just for the students. It was supposed to be a place where meetings could take place, where the community could use the uh, swimming pool. We need to solve this problem. And I, I think there, there is some concern with students uh, intermingling with adults and how this could be bad or how this could be good or whatever it's going to be. It needs to be solved. I don't know if I have the solution. I'm not pretending I have a solution for that. I have not studied, uh, studied this problem at length. But the high school is the people's building. And we voted to fund it based upon the fact that it would be a community building with an auditorium and with a swimming pool. And we've done a pretty good job of letting the public use a swimming pool uh, and use the building, and that should not end. Okay. Bob, Kathleen. Yes. Um, this is an area that I know a lot about. As a high school athletic director, we had tremendous responsibility in terms of scheduling events and supervision of students. The community pool, well, the pool at the high school, I feel this is a very solvable problem, to be quite frank. I think it's a matter of scheduling and supervision. I think classes can be scheduled during the day, but there has to be proper supervision. Um, that being said, there has to be follow-up. There have to be people who are going to be responsible to administer that. I know as a high school athletic director, I'll just give you an example, locker room supervision was of paramount importance. We couldn't impress upon coaches enough that you have to be the first to get to arrive and the last to leave. Kids have to be supervised at all times. If their parents are late to pick them up, too bad. You stay and wait until they get picked up. That supervision is paramount. So I do think this is a solvable problem. I think we can I think classes during the day can be scheduled so that there isn't a conflict with kids, and so the adults can be supervised as well as the children can be supervised. And I will say this, in, in, in the discussion that I saw on television, um, it's more than just a daytime situation. You have to remember, you have athletic teams, you have swim teams, you have football teams that are going in and out of those locker rooms well after 2.30. You have basketball teams that practice in the evening. So, it's going to take a, 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 you know, a very aggressive plan and a, a great plan to enact it, but I know it can be done. Thank you. Thank you. Susan. 
Um, the, the decision to eliminate daytime swimming by adults or during, during while school is in session um, was made as a protective measure because student safety was thought to be a concern. And I think Dr. Canfield actually said it quite well in his final interview. He said, when you have the gift of time to evaluate these situations, then you take that time and you do that. But sometimes an unpopular decision has to be made first and in the interim. And that's what happened here. I think there's ultimately middle ground to be found on this pool issue, whether it takes the form of creative scheduling or background checks or supervision, as Bob said. I think that it's solvable. Um, whether we can make modifications to structures, I know that had been investigated and, and, and uh, determined not to be such a great idea. But there are different ways to make this work for everybody. And I echo what Mike said as well about the intent of the building having been to serve the community. It has to be done with the children's safety first and foremost. But I think there's probably middle ground to be had. Thank you. And Sherry. Yes. Uh, um, I agree. Uh, there definitely can be a solution to this. The classes during the day can be rescheduled, but there also can be structures or changes put in place where people can use the pool during the school day. The um, office of the uh, pool director does have a toilet and shower facility. This could be used in conjunction with possibly some type of structures for changing in the back of the pool. As we're speaking, probably, they, um, this issue is being worked on. This is not um, a dead issue. It's, it is uh, continuously being looked at, not only by the school department themselves, but uh, they've had the fire inspector in the uh, building inspector and um, I believe the health inspector also is, is or is going to be involved. He has been notified to help with the solution. So the lockers are locked. They are a difficult um, solution in the sense of trying to change those. The way the lockers are set up to, to try to separate out um, the adults from the children would be a real structural uh, change because of the, the way the toilets and the showers are all set up in there. But I think there are alternatives to this, as I stated, and these are lo being looked into. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next question deals with national problems, really, and so, um, and they are everywhere. It reads, with the rise of childhood obesity and childhood aggression, what measures can the school committee take to mitigate these problems? What can schools do to help? And we will start with Susan. Childhood obesity and, and what now? Aggression. Aggression. Unrelated, I assume. Um, Childhood obesity in, in schools. I, I know people have been getting letters home that their that their children's BMI was um, measured, and here's what it is, and here's where she falls on the scale. And people have have distinctly mixed feelings about that evaluation happening in schools. I and mean, we were taking children out of the classroom to go weigh and measure them, and then send a letter letter home about their size. That's um, that's something parents I think feel belongs in, un, under their purview and not schools. Um, as to aggression, get, getting into bullying and anti-bullying anti curricula and programs, I, th I think that's very, very important. Schools need to be safe places for everyone to learn. And um, there needs to be at the, resist, you know, at the risk of repeating a cliche, a, a zero tolerance policy for, for bullying behavior in schools. We can't have it. I think what my girls report is happening at the Oak Ridge School 
is they have a program called Bully Busters, where older kids come into their classrooms and they do skits and they talk about different scenarios and how you would feel in this or that um, setting and what you would do as a bystander versus what you would do if you felt this way towards somebody. And it's starting that thought process very, very early in their educations. And it touches me. I think it's, I think it's terrific. The responsive classroom program that they have that establishes social connections between them from very early grades on teaches mutual respect and how to get along. I think those are terrific first steps. Okay, thank you. And Sherry, would you follow up? Mm -hmm. Um, during this past year, we have been working on um, bullying, as you know, in the schools. Uh, policy was developed and um, professional development um, was done within the schools. Um, it is right in the forefront now. It's also, I was reading in the paper that um, a physician from Cape Cod Hospital did a uh, program on it. So this is really, as you said, a national um, wide uh, problem. But I think that Sandwich is definitely um, addressing it. And as I said, we've already developed the policy. Um, as far as obesity goes, uh, previously I was on a, uh, for many years, on the health committee. And it included the nurse, the um, head of dietary. And through that committee, uh, many changes were made. Um, the snacks were upgraded from um, cakes to more um, healthier foods. Even the food choices themselves were um, upgraded as well as increasing the choices. And I think that um, as far as the schools, um, that is um, a very important way to tackle or to help tackle this problem. Thank you, Bob. Yes, thanks. In terms of the obesity, um, you know, my daughter has phys ed twice a week for 30 minutes. And that's certainly not enough. So I, as a parent, have a responsibility to make sure she is active. And I think all of us have parents. I mean, there comes a point when the schools absolutely cannot have the answer for everything. It's up to the parents and kids at a certain age to take personal responsibility. We need to keep our kids active, there's no question. And I know times have changed. You know, when I grew up, there were three channels and we had no technology, so we didn't have a lot of choices. But today, you know, we're fighting, we're fighting the couch stuff. And, um, but I do, I, I do think a lot of that is up to the parents to follow through. As far as the aggressiveness, I have experience as an assistant to the principal where I dealt with discipline. And I think part of that can be a family issue and maybe sometimes a lack of parent involvement. But in most cases, there are some issues with the kids for whatever reasons. And I think the anti-bullying, I think, um, you know, the good role modeling from classroom teachers can all be very helpful. Intervention from social workers or from guidance counselors in school, I think that's all very helpful. And, and the earlier that starts, the better. So. I think in terms of aggression, the schools have a role. In terms of obesity, yeah, we can try to control what we offer in the CAF and control what we offer for snacks, but I, I really think the parents and the guardians play the most important role there. Thank you. All right, and Mike. You know, I, I grew up a, a son of an Italian immigrant family, and I ate a lot of pasta because we were poor, and I was a little roly-poly and uh, would go to school and get bullied all the time. Um, little fat Italian boy. Uh, that's never going to end. We would kid ourselves by thinking that bullying is going to end by some school program and the like. I, I do think that, uh, that uh, parents have to become more involved in teaching their children how to handle it. Uh, my grandmother used to handle it. When I'd come home from school, she'd sit me on her knee and she would tell me about all the great Italians and uh, just because they called you a fat Italian boy. They, there were a lot of fat Italians who did a lot of nice things. But um, nutrition, though, is another point. I think we could do a better job of teaching nutrition in school. Uh, nutrition um, is not understood by parents, let alone uh, the students. I have no problems with banning unhealthful foods from schools. Um, a soda pop full of sugar and um, 
some of the things that I've seen, although I have not uh, directly experienced anything in the sandwich schools, uh, some, some very poor choices in, in the school lunch programs in different schools that I've been involved with. So in any case, um, I think this is more of a parental, a, a parental, a parental concern than there's a, a concern for the school, uh, schools. All the schools can do something, uh, can, can help. But I think it's mostly a parental concern. All right. I think we have time for one more question before the closing statement. There were three, really, that came in related to aspects of the budget, and I've been trying to figure out how to combine them. But um, part of the sense of one of them is what is your experience with managing large amounts of money, like the school budget, and then uh, oversight of the school budget, and the school spending down to zero every year rather than returning any excesses. Uh, so what would be your comments regarding, let's, let's call it, the way the present budget or the way the school budget is managed and are there ways to improve that in terms of accountability? Does that make any sense to you? What was the first part? Mm -hmm. the, the concerns were qualifications for, man, for managing large amounts of money. What's your experience with that? And then I guess really the question is what kind of accountability should there be in handling the school portion of your, do you, do you vote on both things in one, in one vote as a town? Yeah, okay. It's a combination. Yeah, okay. So that, is that clear enough? Okay. And uh, we'll start with Mike. Okay. Well, in my business career, at one point I had 70 employees um, as spread over 12 different locations um, and uh, n knew how to run a business and show a profit. In the late 1970s, I was elected to the New Bedford School Committee, where I served two years as chairman, the third largest school district in the state at the time with a huge budget. And I served there for eight years. I have always been an advocate of something that Jimmy Cotter in, introduced to the world, and that's zero-based budgeting. A lot of people say we do it here in town. We don't. Zero-based budgeting is when you go back to zero, and you have every department come in and tell you what their needs are, explain their programs, and justify the programs. It gives you an opportunity to look at a program that's working or not working. What we use in government is, uh, our budget last year was uh, $1 million, and we made sure we didn't give any back, and so we need another 4%. That's how it works. Uh, and that's wrong. That's not the way to do it. The way to do it is zero-based budgeting, going back, every department has nothing when they start. And then they come in and justify everything they want. And the school committee has a, the, the, the chance to vet that publicly. And I think that's where we have to go. Okay, Susan? My experience managing buz budgets comes from my project management experience as a, an environmental consultant. I didn't have any $30 million projects. I had lots of ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 projects. The principles are the same. The amounts are different. I, I learned to make the budgets for time, materials, labor, um, equipment, and to stay within the budget because the client was going to pay what the client was going to pay regardless of whether the project went over. As far as the way the school budget is managed and accountability, the budget is, is certainly available online to anybody who wants to look at it. It's a lot to wade through, but it is public. I don't believe that there are secret slush funds or, or anything like that to, to ferret out so much. My understanding is that the accounting in the school budget is, is different than other, in other settings because grants fall on different calendars and there are different reporting requirements for different funding sources. And um, I defer to the expertise of the business administrator in, in all of that because, as I say, I'm, I'm not from an education background. 
there is a public forum on the budget every year, and that's an opportunity for, for people to pipe up. I think that could probably be uh, made more robust. But the, the, the process is, with, with online um, resources, fairly transparent. The, uh, the differences in accounting are things I have to learn. Okay, thank you. Sherry? Thank you. Um, I have been involved in the school budgets um, for the 21 years. Um, some uh, school budgets are clearer than others during uh, years. Right now, I personally would like to see um, a clearer school budget. Um, I think um, it would behoove us to know um, more specifically where personnel are located in the budget um, and to know, uh, have a better handle on the specific cost of programs. Um, and as far as the um, not uh, sending as much money back to the town as say the town budget does, because of the way um, a school budget works that you can move money within the budget, um, what happens a lot towards the end of the school year is um, that supplies are bought ahead of time. Um, I'm not saying that we should use all the money. I'm not saying that at all. Also, um, what can be paid ahead to is out of district special education uh, payments. So some of these are done year to year. Um, but with that being said, obviously the schools if there is money at the end, obviously should be um, sending it back to the town to uh, be combined with what is left in the town budget. Thank you. Bob. Thank you. Um, as a high school athletic director, I was responsible for my own budget, and that would range, uh, you know, I've had budgets of 500,000 and maybe as small as a couple hundred thousand. Uh, <clears throat> I'm used to getting squeezed. I'm used to having the superintendent or the principal contact me in March and April and say, uh, you know, we need 20,000 and somehow we would make it work. So I have some experience with that. Um, I think if you examine the long range plan for the town of Sandwich, there's an interesting area in there and it, and it involves the school committee and the board of selectmen. There's, there's a note about a chief financial officer and I think that really has to be looked at and looked at closely. We, we may need to pursue a chief financial officer who would oversee the school monies and the town monies. And now I do understand, and I think everybody needs to know, that the school budget does operate in a different manner from the town budget. And as, as some of my colleagues up here have mentioned, there are reasons for that. Um, there has to be sort of an ebb and a flow. You may have a special ed student move into, into town that requires a certain expenditure. Um, you know, there are grants that come in and sometimes the grants get postponed or you may postpone the grant till the next year. Sherry mentioned the fact that you can pay ahead on special ed and that's not a bad thing. It's sort of like, you know, you, you may make an extra mortgage payment ahead for yourself on a personal basis. So. Um, I think people need to understand you do need to have some flexibility and there's a reason why the school budget is in the handling of it is in the accounting is a little bit different from the town. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we'll begin the final portion of the forum with closing statements of one minute and we will start in reverse order. So Susan Sundmeyer will go first. Thank you. We've covered a lot of ground tonight. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for holding the forum, Sandwich Community Television for airing it, everyone watching at home and here for your attention and involvement. This is a critical time for our school system. We have a great opportunity to move forward and we can't afford to be without a well-functioning school committee to guide our schools credibly and cooperatively. The challenges ahead are going to require us to work together. I've been a familiar face in the audience at school committee meetings and I'd like a place at the table. My personal qualities and my experience in business and government make me a good choice for the job. Many voters see this election as a chance to increase professionalism on the committee so that we can properly focus on our children's learning and intellectual growth. Let's do that. Let's live up to the best that Sandwich can be. I'm ready to get to work and I ask for your vote on May 5th. 
Thank you. Go ahead, Mike. As a father of four and a grandfather to six, I've always had a passion for good education. Uh, I am a product of public education. I uh, grew up a poor Italian boy in Providence, Rhode Island, went up through the system, graduated from college, got my graduate degrees. Uh, a few years ago, I was given an, honor an honorary degree, Doctor of Humane Letters, for advancing education. So I have a history of helping education and working with education. All of my children went through public schools. I believe in public schools. I believe public schools are part of the great American principle. I have a son who's a chiropractor, a daughter who just graduated chiropractic school, and I have two of my children who are teachers. So we talk education all the time in my family. And I can tell you that I'm interested in improving the lives of others. That's why I became a doctor in the first place. I like helping people, and I really want to help the children here in Sandwich by listening and then deciding. Thank you. Thank you. Sherry? Thank you. Um, I once again want to thank the League of Women Voters and Paige and everyone for today. Thank you for the audience both at home and here. And I would just like to say that we have covered a lot of uh, territory tonight. And with all these um, issues that we've been talking about that the school is facing, um, I bring experience and a proof of commitment to the students and to the district. And I am asking for your vote on May 5th. Thank you. Okay, Bob. Thank you very much. And I want to thank, this has been quite an audience here tonight in person. You guys are extremely att attentive. Um, we've, we have covered many topics tonight. And I want to bring the focus back to the 3,400 young children and adults that we have pledged to serve. Um, I want to remind everybody that it takes a village to raise a child. It's going to take all of us collectively to do a great job for our kids. In closing, I want to say that, and this is to the people at home, um, you know, your, your children may be in bed, or you may be fighting to put them in, into bed now, or they may be telling you they're going to stay up late and watch the Butler Yukon game, and that's all good. <laughs> but I'll tell you, there's a superstar in every one of those kids. And I think collectively, we need to work together to bring that superstardom out of each and every one of those kids that live here in Sandwich. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to offer a special thanks to our timekeepers, Emma Vitaco, Barry Thomas, our question sorters, uh, Renata Sands, and Karen Miller, and Ellen right there. Thank you so much for your running. She was the runner. And thank you, Paige. For Paige did all the logistics hard work. And again, we would love to have you join the league. There are membership forums there. We have a special introductory rate. And um, people at home listening, they can just go on the web and check out www.lwvcapecot.org and join too. And you all can join. You can join. You can join. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Nice job, Thanks. 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 Thanks.